Um, good morning, everyone. How are we today? Thank you for braving the rain and coming out and for not booking holidays today. <laughs> we weren't sure how many people would show up because obviously it's school holidays at the moment and we do have quite a few people today, but it's really lovely to see all your faces. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Breda, for that worship. It was beautiful. One thing I really, really love about this church community is just, um, I think the authenticity of, of the people here. This is a community where people just pitch in and help out. It doesn't always have to be a big show. It doesn't always have to be really perfect or shiny. But I think there is something so powerful just about a voice and a guitar and just someone showing up with a heart of worship and just leading us into that space. So I really love that. Thank you. Um, welcome. You are very welcome here at our church today. Um, we are looking at a series called Milestones. And I guess the, the heart behind this series is to really do some like specific teaching, and reflect on the key spiritual practices that we participate in as Christians. Um, these are core parts of how we express our faith. And I think it's really great that we get an opportunity to actually just really learn about these things. And even though we're quite familiar with them, if you've been a Christian for a while or you've been around church for a while, even if you haven't, you're probably familiar with quite a few of these practices, things like worship, prayer, communion. Um, we did dedication previously. Last week we looked at eldership. And it's just really important, I think, for us to know what the foundations of our faith actually are. These are ways that we express our faith in God. Um, and it's really great that we get to look into those in more depth. And today, we're going to be looking at why we study the Bible. And it's meant to say Bible at the bottom. <laughs> Had a few issues with the slides, so just forgive me if they don't make sense. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you figured it out. Um, so why we study the Bible. Um, as mentioned, this is one of my most favorite topics to talk about. It is something that I'm incredibly passionate about and I have the privilege of spending much of my time um, doing. Um, at the moment, I let, yes, I'm an elder here and I, I teach here, which is just one of my absolute passions and privileges, but I also head up the Biblical Studies Department at Innerborough School. Uh, which is another amazing privilege, and I just love it. So I get to teach the Bible to young people every day, and it is just amazing. Such a great opportunity. Um, so today I hope to share with you just some insights um, from my own experiences of engaging with the Bible throughout the years, um, some of my own story, uh, debunk a few myths, which will be fun, and, well, maybe not, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> and hopefully give you some fresh inspiration for engaging with the Bible, maybe with some new eyes, maybe in a new way. Hopefully really encourage you. Hopefully maybe even bring some healing to you if the Bible is a bit of a point of contention for you, because it can be. Um, but we'll talk about that a bit later. But first, we're going to go old school and play a game of Bible trivia. You can tell I'm a teacher. This is what we're going to do. All right, you ready? So this is our first question, and you have to be brave and put your hands up. Um, okay, first question. How many books are in the Bible? A, 55. Who thinks A? Who thinks B, 66? Who thinks C, 77? Who has no idea? <laughs> And that's okay. The answer is B, 66. There are 66 books in the Bible. There are 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. That's a lot of books. Okay, next question. What languages was the Bible written in? A, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Who thinks A? A few people. B, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Who thinks B? Okay, C, English. <laughs> I hope nobody puts their hand up on that one. <laughs> Sometimes we forget that the Bible was actually not written in English. It is translated, and the correct answer is A. It was written in Hebrew. Most of the Old Testament is in Hebrew. 
Uh, Some of the New Testament is in Aramaic. The book of Daniel was written in Aramaic. And a lot of Jesus' original teachings were in Aramaic before they were then translated. And then the New Testament is written in Greek. Uh, Koine Greek, which is a common Greek. Uh, We can thank Alexander the Great for that. Um, But yeah, those are the languages that the Bible is written in. Next question. What is the time period between the Testaments called? A, the in-between. I actually think that's a really cool thing. B, the Industrial Revolution. Sounds cool. C, the Intertestamental Period. It's obviously C. Yes, that's right. So there is a period of time between the Testaments. It's called the Intertestamental Period. And there are actually quite a number of writings that exist from that period of time, and they're included in the Orthodox and the Catholic Bibles, but not the Protestant Bible. So if you have the NAV or something like that, you would have a Protestant Bible. And that's why we have a big gap of about 300 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. That's just a bit of trivia for you. But if you want to know about those in-between writings, go pick up a Catholic Bible and you can read about it. Okay. What event prompted Mary and Joseph to travel to Bethlehem? Was it A, Roman persecution? B, Roman census, or C, Hillsong Conference. (laughs) What are we thinking? B, yeah, that's right. It was a Roman census. So what that meant was that the Romans decided they wanted to count all of the people, well, the men, the women and children weren't counted, count all of the men um, involved in the empire. Those were the only ones considered actual humans. Uh, so they, what they actually had to do was travel to their place of birth. And here's a little bit of interesting trivia for you. Uh, we often think that when Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem and they couldn't find room at an inn, we think of that as like a hotel, right? That's how I used to think of it. But contextually, that's not actually the case. The place where they would have gone would have actually been the home of a family member of Joseph. And so, but the thing is, is because everybody from his family would have gone to Bethlehem because they had to, there was no room in that house and no one was willing to give up their room for Mary and Joseph. And so they had to go under the house where the animals were kept at night to prevent them from being stolen um, or taken away. So that's the context of that. It's a house. It kind of changes the meaning slightly, I think. Makes it a little bit more, like, wrong. (laughs) Um, Okay, this one's interesting. How many years passed between Paul, the Apostle Paul's conversion and his first ministry journey? Is it A, 13 years, B, 8 years, or C, 2 years? What are we thinking? It is 13, 13 years. And that is something I think that most of us don't realise or really think about. But from the time that Paul had his major conversion, he did go to Jerusalem. The Council of Jerusalem argued for the inclusion of the Gentiles. We see that in Acts. And then he just realises that everything he thought he knew isn't actually true or, you know, it's totally different now that he realises that Jesus is the Messiah And he goes away for 13 years and re-studies all of the scriptures to try and understand how they all lead to Jesus being the Messiah. And then he starts his missionary journeys. So I think that's quite helpful for us to know about Paul. We think that all of these letters just came from thin air immediately. That's not true. It took a lot of study, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of reflection, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. So that's a good segue. All right, well done, everybody. You did great. All right, so why we read the Bible, why we study the Bible. Um, A little bit of my background, my history with the Bible. Um, I went to Bible college. I did a theology degree. And it was there that I was introduced, firstly, to this world of biblical and historical scholarship. And this really brought the Bible to life for me. I learn about the historical context 
of the world in which the Bible was set. I learnt the languages that it was written in. Uh, I learnt about the symbolism and the imagery that was used by the biblical authors. I learnt about the geographical significance of the Bible. I went to Israel and travelled to all of those significant places and looked at what those geographical contexts, how they contribute to the story. Um, yeah, and just ignited with a passion for the biblical text, for the symbolism, for the language. It just opened the Bible up to me. It made it come alive. And it's been a passion, a journey that I've been on ever since. Um, it is, I, I told you that I work teaching um, biblical studies, so I engage in biblical study myself constantly, and uh, my own pastime, I know this makes me a total nerd, but I love just listening to Bible podcasts and just reading books and just trying to learn more and understand more about the Bible. So that Bible college experience for me was just a really enlightening experience, um, totally changed my life and the way that I saw the Bible. Uh, but it was also a very triggering experience. And I think this is something I want to talk about because uh, I grew up in a Christian home and I went to church um, as a young person all throughout my childhood. Um, I've, yeah, always gone to church. Um, and some of the perceptions I had about the Bible, what it actually was, what it's meant to be used for, how we were meant to engage with it, uh, I realised it was actually quite damaging. And I think Bible college, that experience of, of learning about what the Bible actually is and learning about what it's meant to be used for really highlighted just how kind of warped my perception of the Bible actually was. Um, I grew up in the youth group culture of the early 2000s. It's a really unique <laughs> time speak to anybody sort of around my age who grew up in that time and you'll hear a lot of very interesting stories and unfortunately it was actually a time characterized by the bible being weaponized against young people it really was um that was my experience especially we were warned that if we didn't read our bible every day we weren't pleasing god uh, we had bible verses thrown at us to try and prevent us from being impure and all sorts of things like this, it was often used as a measuring stick of morality, measuring our worth um, on how well we met its standards. And so that was my experience growing up. And I loved God, and I loved the church, and I loved the Bible. But when I got to college, I realized just how misused it was. And I think... This is why I take Bible study so seriously. Because I know what it's like to experience the Bible being used as a weapon and as a sort of a means to control and manipulate. And unfortunately, it is the way that the Bible can be used um, even today. And like I said, I, I wasn't sure whether I should sort of talk about this, but I think it's really important. When we talk about the Bible and we talk about why we study it and why we read it, this is a very common story of people feeling vulnerable and hurt by the way that the Bible has been used against them. And it's an important conversation to have and it's important to acknowledge and validate that experience. Um, yeah, so it's within this conversation this sort of tension of, of my experience of being enlightened and inspired by how to read the Bible, about by the history and the symbolism, but then also at the same time being sort of triggered and, and dealing with the hurt and dealing with the manipulation and the weaponization of the Bible. It's this tension, this space that I want to talk from today um, and sort of talk about why we study the Bible in that context. And I want to avoid talking about the usual answers to this question. I know often when we talk about why we read the Bible, you know, it enhances our faith and it helps us, you know, guide us through life. And, and that's all true. That's true. But I want to go a bit deeper today. Um, so 
I hope that after this morning's message, you can see that exploring and engaging with the Bible in a really deep and rich way is actually an act of resistance against efforts to control um, and oppress people with the biblical text. So, I've put together what I think are some really essential principles for engaging with the Bible in an authentic and humble way. Now, these are by no means comprehensive. Um, There are, I think, the beauty of the Bible, it's been around for thousands of years and it just continues to have relevance and continues to inspire and continues to just change and transform people's lives over time, over generations, over centuries. But these are a few that I've experienced in my life so far. And I hope you'll find them helpful. Okay. So the first little principle that I want to talk to you about today is navigate the narrative. Go with a little, yeah. All the words are on there. That's good. Okay. So when I grew up, I heard many, many, many sermons and messages where the preachers would take uh, verses plucked from here and there to kind of support their points. Um, This is called pearl stringing, or uh, another word for that is eisegesis. It's kind of where you have the point that you want to make and then you kind of pluck a Bible verse from out of there and, you know, use it to back up your point as though it's sort of evidence. Um, it's, It's a pretty dangerous thing to do because it means that the verse is taken completely out of context. There's no consideration given to what this verse meant within the broader context of the story or to the people that it was actually originally written to. So my time at Bible uh, College and the study that I've done ever since has kind of made me really realise just how important context is when you're studying the Bible. Um, We need to understand what was being said who it was being said to and what its original meaning was because if we don't do that, we're really at risk of coming up with a bit of a warped theology and that can actually cause quite a bit of harm. Now, if I was to define the Bible and what it actually is, I would say that it's a collection of individual writings that were written mostly by Hebrew and also some Greek uh, authors over thousands of years. And each of these writings were set in a particular place and a particular time. They had their own unique symbols. They had their own unique meanings. uh, They were written to particular people. And they all come from the ancient Mesopotamian and Mediterranean world. The amazing thing about these stories is that they give us an insight into what the people at the time believed about God and what they believed about the world around them. And we can really see the Bible as a reflection of those beliefs, a reflection of those ideas. And one of the things I love about reading the Bible is you can actually see these ideas grow. They develop, they change, and they mature over time. And I think it's really important to see the Bible that way. So each of these individual stories, they all have their own context, they all have their own histories, and it's important to acknowledge their individuality. But when we start to acknowledge the broader context of these stories, we actually see, amazingly, that somehow these things written over thousands of years mysteriously work together to tell one big unified story. It's actually phenomenal, absolutely amazing how this works. And the story, um, I love how N.T. Wright sort of summarises this. Uh, He's a Bible scholar and he says, the Bible tells the story of God and the world, of creation and covenant, of creation spoiled and covenant broken, and then of covenant uh, renewed and creation restored. 
when we get to read the Bible, we need to navigate this narrative. We recognise the unique context of each passage of scripture and we learn about its meaning. I'll give you a bit of an example of how this works. We're going to talk about one of my favourite passages in the Bible. I'm sure you're all very fond of it as well. It's a very famous one, Uh, Psalm 23. So I'm going to read this out to you today. So I think it's up on the screen there. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love this psalm, and there's so much in it, but I'm just going to focus on the first part today. <clears throat> now, when you read this psalm on its own, and you read those first few words, Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing, he makes me lie down in green pastures, you kind of think of that, right? Green, lush grass, little fluffy sheep. It's kind of like when you go to New Zealand, if anyone's been there, you kind of go anywhere in New Zealand, even sort of drive through the city, and you see like green paddocks and sheep everywhere. But when you actually look into the context of this passage, we actually find that it's not set in a green, fluffy pasture thing like that. It's actually set in the Judean wilderness. I've got a picture of that there. So when David wrote this psalm, that is what he was looking at. And I don't know about you, but that looks pretty (laughs) barren. It's a desert wasteland. There's not much greenery there. And this is Israel we're talking about here. So if you know, if you understand the geographical context of Israel, you understand that there's actually no sources of fresh water apart from the rain. So you are completely dependent on the rain for water. And that doesn't happen all the time. And so you don't get those lush paddocks of grass. That's not a thing. Okay? So... You kind of understand why David is like the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death. You get that idea from this because if you get stuck in there without water, without food, you're gone. You can't survive that. Now, David, we know, was a shepherd. So he had to learn how to keep his sheep alive in this context, in this place. And he would have learnt from his experiences that in Israel, when the sun sets in the evening, cool mist kind of collects in the air. And then what happens is it creates condensation, little dew drops form on the ground, and the tiniest little tufts of grass just sort of sprout up in between the rocks and the limestone and the dirt. Just the tiniest little things. You can barely even see them. But the shepherd knew the land intimately and knew the weather and knew everything about this whole situation and knew where those little tufts of grass would be, knew exactly when to lead the sheep there before they dried up in the hot sun. So the shepherd would lead the sheep through the wilderness, through the barren land to find those tiny little tufts of that green life-giving grass and the sheep were completely reliant on the shepherd for their survival. If the sheep were left to wander alone, they wouldn't survive. They had to trust in the leading of the shepherd. I think this gives it such a powerful meaning. I think it just changes the way we sort of see this psalm. It does for me. And then we see through stories like this, through passages like this, this symbol of the shepherd being associated with a saviour. And then, of course, Jesus is described as the great shepherd. And it's in connection with ideas like this. Trusting that Jesus, that God, would lead us through the dark times, would help us to find those tiny little tufts of grass when we desperately need them 
and it might not look lush and green. There's no grazing on that, like, paddock. And, you know, it's a dangerous place to be. But when you trust the shepherd, you will have what you need. If we want to study the Bible properly and avoid damaging theology, it's really important for us to navigate the narrative. This means that when we read the Bible, we need to recognize that every verse belongs within the chapter, every chapter belongs within the book, and then every book somehow contributes to this bigger picture. It takes time and effort to learn about this, but it is so incredibly valuable to learn how the individual pieces of the Bible fit into that broader tapestry. Now, the next little thing I want to talk to you about, that was navigate the narrative, so looking at the Bible as a bigger picture and what that can do to help us read the Bible and study the Bible. But the second thing I want to talk to you about is commit to conversation. This might sound a bit strange, but I'll tell you what I mean in a second. Uh, Again, when I grew up, I was told that the Bible was a guidebook for life. I'm sure many of us have heard that before. It functioned to tell us what to do, to live according to God's will. Uh, It provided answers for how to get through the tough times. If we had any problems, you go read the Bible, you will find the answer there. That's how I grew up understanding what the Bible was. Um, But I actually think now that that is quite a misrepresentation of what the Bible is and how it's meant to function. There are many problems uh, with that definition, but I think one that disturbs me the most is that it makes the Bible seem really stagnant. And the Bible is just so much more than that. I read a book a couple of years ago by a Jewish scholar that completely changed the way I saw the Bible. This scholar is a rabbi, um, and he talked about how the Old Testament scriptures reveal a God who wants to be in conversation with his people. He explained that in Genesis 1, we're introduced to a God who intentionally creates the world through a process of call and response. We get this image of God hovering over the darkness of the waters in Genesis 1. Uh, looking at the chaos, staring into the emptiness, and then God speaks the words, let there be. And these words become an invitation for the earth to emerge from the chaos and transcend it. And it reaches its full potential as it does that. What's really cool about this story is that we see a God that speaks, let there be, and then the language of the text shows us that creation is actually responding to those words. In other words, we're not seeing a controlling God who imposes a will on creation as if it's all preconceived, this is exactly how it was meant to look, how it was meant to be but rather we see a process of call and response. It's like a dialogue, a conversation between God and the created world. And what I found most amazing about this interpretation was that when God created humans, he empowered them to speak. In other words, God decides to invite humans into this creative process gives them the ability to create for themselves, to confront the chaos around them, and to transform it into something beautiful. This is this concept of conversation. It's a theme that runs throughout the whole biblical text. I mean, we see God calling to Abraham, Abraham responds to God. And then in the Exodus story, we see the Israelites enslaved under Pharaoh, and they cry out to God, and God responds to them. It's this dialogue of conversation. Story after story, we see a God who's committed 
to a dialogue with his people. And it's clear from the text that God wants to be in partnership with his people. He doesn't want to control and manipulate them. We also see examples of when the Israelites refused to participate in conversation. So in Exodus 32, Moses is up on the mountain. He's literally having a conversation with God. This is where he receives the um, Ten Commandments and the tablets. He's up there talking to God. And the people down the bottom are getting a bit fed up with waiting. And they decide that instead of participating in this conversation, they are going to create their own God. And they create this golden calf. It's a thing. But the significance about this story is that that calf, that thing that's made out of gold, it doesn't speak. It doesn't talk. It's dead. It seems like the easier option. Conversation and dialogue require deep reflection, require confrontation, require action and transformation. Dead things don't require any of that. And you can see the Israelites end up just going absolutely nuts, doing whatever they want, because this God won't hold them to account. It's, it's a dead, it's a thing. What's then really interesting is that when God finds out that the Israelites had done that, if you're familiar with the story, he says to Moses, right, that's it, I'm killing them all. <laughs> I'm getting rid of them. And Moses, as a human, a created human, says to God, no, I don't want you to do that. I don't think you should do that. Let's talk about this. And what does God do? He listens and he changes his mind and he says, all right, I'll give them another chance. Fascinating. So we get this incredible story of this conversation, this dialogue. So we see a God who is not stagnant, controlling, unmoving, that requires unquestioned obedience. That's not the God of the Bible. This is a God who is committed to conversation, who invites us into the conversation too. A God who wants to partner with us and empower us to transform the chaos around us. When we see the Bible as a guidebook or a manual for living, we limit the freedom and the creative possibilities that the story invites us into. It is such a deeper and richer experience to see the Bible as an opportunity to commit to a conversation with God, to listen to where God is leading, and really importantly, to know that God will listen to us. This is also quite challenging because it puts the responsibility back on us to transform the chaos of the world around us. This isn't an, oh, just leave it to God situation. The conversation invites us into the transformation process. God has empowered us to speak, but more importantly, I think, to listen, to listen to the stories of how systems and structures in our world disembody the image of God in people and then speak against that culture of power and control that seeks to oppress and dispossess. Our words have creative and liberative power. And as we see the Bible as an invitation into conversation with God, we can be empowered to listen to the stories of those around us and use our voices to help transform the chaos. So join the conversation. All right, last one. So we've talked about navigating the narrative, so seeing the Bible as this unified story. It's kind of like going on an art exhibition, so walking through it, navigating the narrative. 
and then joining in the conversation, not seeing the Bible as the stagnant thing over there that I just go to when I need help, but it invites us into a conversation. We participate in the dialogue of transformation in our world. And the last one that I want to talk to you about is the language of liberation. You like my alliteration? (laughs) Okay, so again, growing up, these are my little myth buster things. Um, I was given the impression from preachers and leaders around me that the Bible was clear, it was straightforward, it was simple, and everything pointed to Jesus, and Jesus brought about salvation, and that was it. All you needed to know, done. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not quite that simple. Um, I experienced so many messages that were so certain of the Bible's purpose and its meaning. And this mostly provided good content for self-help and motivational talks. And that's not a bad thing. But again, it really misses what the Bible actually is and what it's meant to do and how we're meant to engage with it. The more I studied the Bible, the more I realised how much I didn't know. (laughs) It was actually really confronting, Uh, and it's still true. The more I read, the more I realise how much I don't know. It's scary. Uh, But it's very important, because I had been taught as a young person that knowledge was power when it came to the Bible, and that the goal was intellectual superiority. Know as much as you can about the Bible so you can be the best Christian that you can be. Know all the verses, all the powerful ones, all the ones that you can whip out in conversations and arguments with people. But after a while, I realised that this perspective was actually quite arrogant. And underneath that arrogance was fear fear of being wrong, fear of embracing uncertainty, and fear of losing control of a particular view of God. I think when we focus so much on reading the Bible to attain knowledge, we miss one of the biggest themes of the Bible as a whole, and that's liberation. Liberation is about peacemaking. It's about acknowledging the reality of the suffering of those around us and it's about participating in a process of restoration to set them free. And this, again, this theme of liberation is present throughout the entire Bible. We've just talked about the people being liberated from the Egyptians in Exodus. But I think (coughs) the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and his teachings, are probably where we see this so clearly. In John 4, Jesus gets baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit, goes to the synagogue and declares his mission. And he reads from the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. It's quite remarkable, really. And this passage and many other of Jesus' teachings, such as the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, teaches us this language of liberation. Another way to kind of understand this is this, this concept called prophetic imagination. It's this idea of acknowledging and calling out the darkness of the current reality and being brave enough to imagine an alternative reality. But imagination takes curiosity and curiosity requires humility particularly intellectual humility. So this is all about acknowledging what we don't know 
And even further to that, acknowledging that perhaps what we've been told, perhaps what we believe might actually be wrong. We might have built a whole belief system around bad information and without humility and curiosity, we will never be able to see the limitations of our beliefs. And this limits us in participating in the liberation of suffering. There's an author, um, Oshida Moore, and she wrote this really powerful quote that really challenged me. She says, your lack of curiosity can keep others in bondage. I think that's quite a challenging thing to think about. See, the language of liberation is the language of humility and curiosity. It's so important that we acknowledge that we don't know everything. And that's okay. In fact, it's probably better because we come to the Bible from a place of curiosity rather than a place of certainty. And only then will we truly be able to see the whole point of the story, the holy and sacred work of participating with God to liberate the brokenhearted. And that is what it's all about. We are called as Christians, um, as we study the Bible, I believe, to use our voices, to use this invitation into conversation, to listen and to speak up for those who are suffering, to do what Jesus did, to liberate the brokenhearted. And what's amazing is that the people that Jesus lists, the same ones listed in Isaiah, the poor, the oppressed, the blind, the captives, they are the ones for whom hope is the most risky. And yet Jesus brings that hope and that liberation to them. I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that there are people suffering from the many different systems and structures in the world, but I think also it's really important for us as the church to acknowledge the suffering people have experienced as a result of the church and the misuse of the Bible. It's a really significant thing. It has hurt a lot of people. And I'm not sure whether there are people here today who are feeling that, if you are feeling the heaviness of that today, if you're feeling the weight of that experience of the Bible being misused or weaponized against you, I just want to say I'm deeply sorry for that. Uh, it's been something I've experienced in a very, um, very awful way in my life. And it actually led to me not wanting to read the Bible, not even being able to look at it for a number of years because of the way it was weaponized against me. I was so traumatized by that experience I couldn't even read it for years. Um, and I had a beautiful experience actually where Kim came over to our house and just did this, what I'd probably call like a restoration ritual where we just talked through, she validated our experience and then prayed for healing in that space and I, I feel so grateful to be in this community where I feel loved and supported and, and am able to question and doubt and explore and be in conversation and, and not have things dictated in such a rigid way I think that's such an important place for us to be but I want to acknowledge if you feel the heaviness of the Bible being misused against you I see you I hear you, you are validated and I acknowledge that hurt in you today and I really want to encourage you, please reach out to somebody, 
whether it's today or just somebody that you trust, to just pray through that experience, to be validated in that space. And I think for us now, whether we've had that experience or not, whether we have been a Christian a long time or not, I think it's really, really important for us to be able to come to the Bible with humility. To come to the Bible with curiosity. Knowing that it has a history of being weaponized and being aware of that. But then also being able to join this conversation with God of experiencing that liberation for ourselves and then being able to participate in the liberation of others. When we participate in reading the Bible in that way, when we engage in it in that way, it has the most incredible, transformative and liberative power. It is absolutely remarkable what it can do in the right way and in the right context. And I think we need to reclaim it. I think we need to resist against being the gatekeepers of God's presence. We need to resist using the Bible as a measuring stick of morality, of calling particular groups, particular people, particular ethnicities, particular genders unholy. It's not okay. It can't be done. Reading the Bible is holy and sacred work and it has the space and the power to accept and go beyond any category but also support and and love and embrace diversity. And it's something that we need to be doing and reading about and continuing to grow in our understanding of. How do we ensure that the way that we as the church today engage with and teach the Bible in a way that supports that diversity, in a way that people can come to the Bible without feeling like they're going to be disembodied, without feeling like their true image of God is going to be called unholy because it doesn't fit within our measuring stick, within the church's expectations or standards. It's not okay. We need to resist against that. And I hope that today, these little principles have given you some encouragement, some inspiration and some challenge of maybe how to look at the Bible with fresh eyes. That we hold that tension of of the power and the transformation, but also be very careful with it. just going to pray and then we'll just sing a song and if you do want prayer this morning if you want to pray through that experience or if you're in a place where you feel like you can't read it if you can't read the bible for whatever reason and you want to talk with someone through that or pray through that we're here for you please come and get prayer God, we just thank you for the beautiful book that teaches us about who you are, about the bigger narrative that we get to be a part of. We thank you that you are not a God who controls or imposes an external will on us, that we have to follow with unquestioned obedience, but instead We thank you that you are a God who is committed to dialogue, to conversation with us, and you have invited us into a conversation with you. We thank you that today we've been reminded that humility and curiosity for being are required for being able to imagine an alternative reality to the one we find ourselves in that the life and teachings of Jesus 
Help us to learn the language of liberation so that we can participate in bringing freedom to those who are bound and broken, including ourselves. We thank you for the power of transformation and liberation that we have in the biblical text, in its writings and in its stories. We pray that you would keep our hearts humble. We pray that you would heal the hurt that might be present from the Bible being misused or weaponized against us. We thank you, God, that you are here with us. We thank you that you listen to us. In your name we pray.